Hello coders, today we're going to be talking about APIs. I'm going to give you 10 tips when structuring your API endpoints and also when building an API client. So this video is tailored for both the back-end developer and the front-end developer. Now these tips have certainly helped me out when I've been developing APIs in the last few years or when I've been accessing APIs through a third party. So the first tip is don't expose your database schema in the response of your API endpoints because this is giving away sensitive information about how your data hangs together. You certainly shouldn't have a one-to-one -one between the fields in your database and the properties or parameters that are returned in your API response. So make sure your field names are different and make sure you're not sharing certain fields as well. That brings us neatly on to tip number two, and that is don't expose the IDs of your records if you can help it. Because again, this is a security issue. IDs are something that should be unique to the record, and you certainly don't want to have any kind of incrementing uh, IDs coming back because you don't want to have record number one, record number two, and three being accessed just by complete curiosity. So if you need to return any kind of IDs, I suggest returning either a GUID or just some randomly generated ID that represents that particular record, but doesn't allow the person who is using the API request to alter the ID to get someone else's information. So that is an important point. So exposing of the database schema and exposing of the IDs. The third tip is to try and use HTTPS wherever you possibly can. Because of course, you're gonna be using APIs to perhaps authenticate and authorize users. And they'll be passing over some sensitive information, perhaps bearer tokens, perhaps um, usernames and passwords. And we'll be talking about those kinds of things later on in this video in another tip. So try and keep everything as encrypted as possible. The third tip is explaining other API endpoints in the API return that you're using. So by this, I mean that perhaps have a section in the response that lists out other API requests that can be made against this particular record. So for example, if you're returning a customer record, then you might want to also tell or explain the developer who is using this API that they can also use other API endpoints against this customer record. So perhaps you could have something that returns an API or a link to an API request that returns the customer's orders or returns the customer's profile, that kind of thing. So use the API as a way of documenting your API and other API endpoints as well. It should be a way of explaining the API in general. Now the next tip is to use API versioning because there are loads of times where I've had to change an API and it's perhaps broken something in the API client if you're using multiple devices. Having a way of versioning your API means that you can actually have two basic APIs really. You can have one API that is on version one and you can have another API that is on version two. Um, both accessing the same code base. I'm not saying that you should change your code base, but one could be going to one method and another one could be going to another method and returning different things. This way you can actually start progressing and incrementing your API to different versions. So if there is a bug that is found, then you could be fixing that, putting that up to the next version of the API. It also means that you have an ability to have snapshots of the APIs at certain times. And I've worked on projects where different devices require different things, and those things perhaps aren't supported in different API versions. And so this is a very good way of basically trying to make everything work as well as it possibly can. Because of course, with your API uh, endpoints, they could be accessed from various different things. They could be accessed from mobile phones, tablets, they could be accessed serverless, all sorts of things might rely on those API endpoints and they may require different versions of those APIs.
Now, the next tip is about HTTP status codes. I've seen all sorts of status codes being used in the wrong context. So, for example, if an API request was made and something completely blew up on the server, then perhaps I would get a status code of 200 OK and then have something in the JSON payload that says something has blown up. Well, that is just complete nonsense because 200 OK does not mean that something has blown up. That's a 500 internal server error. If the resource hasn't been found, then that's a 404. If there has a, been a bad argument that's been supplied, then that's a 400. It certainly isn't a 200 OK. And of course, if you can't access the the resource or whatever you're trying to do, then that's probably a 401. And there are certainly so many more different HTTP status codes. I'll put out a link in the show notes where you can actually find and discover different HTTP status codes that you should be using in certain circumstances in your response. So going back to the previous tip where we're explaining the API, and documenting that. You want to be using these status codes to be explaining the behavior of the actual request that you've actually tried to make. So if you try and access an API endpoint that doesn't exist, it should be a 404. If you access a record on a database that doesn't exist, again, that should be a 404. It shouldn't be a 200 OK with a message in the payload saying resource couldn't be found or record can't be found or user can't be found because you're not using your status codes correctly. The next tip is rate limits and throttling. And you might be thinking, well, this is a good idea, but it's actually a bit of work. So let's worry about this whenever we need to, whenever we get to that point where we need to be putting in rate limits or when we need to be putting in API versioning. And I highly recommend that you actually do this as soon as you possibly can when you're building the foundations of your API, because this is all about scalability. And you don't know when your application is going to be scaling. Hopefully it will scale and hopefully it will scale well. And one thing that will support scaling of your API is rate limits, because essentially what you're doing with your with your rate limits is you're saying that this device or this developer or this whatever it is that is doing the request has a certain number of uh, API requests that it can do within a period of time. And if it reaches that threshold, then you can return a status code that says that that rate limit has been breached. After API rate limits, we have authorization and authentication. And I highly recommend you put this in place, even if you've got a very simple API and a very simple front end. Perhaps you just have a front end website, a back end web server, and an API layer. Even if you have that structure, you should have some layer of authorization and authentication in place. And what I usually do is use OAuth2 because that has a series of very good grant types that are very well suited for different scenarios. So in the scenario of having a front end website and an API where you're not actually registering any kind of users, it's just literally a front end and a back end and you've got the API layer in between, then you would perhaps use something like an auth code or client credentials. If, however, you were using some sort of login form and registration, then you would need to use something that is a little bit more tailored towards the user logging in and logging out. And that perhaps could be a password grant type. And of course, there's other grant types as well. I do talk about these in great depth in the courses that I've done for packed publishing, and I'll put links into the description of those. Following on from the security side of things, you want to be very consistent with both the response of your API as well as the URL that makes up that API request. So if you have different resources that you're returning and you're requesting, you want to make sure that those conventions are the same throughout all of your requests and your responses. So don't call a user a user in one instance and then call that user a customer in another instance. Perhaps change your thinking to have that is a user with the type of customer. 
And then you've, you're really defining the domains and you're defining them very, very coherently. And that will be seen throughout the response and the request. Again, like I go back to the previous tips, you are documenting and describing your system in a way that isn't going to expose how the system is structured, but is going to be easy for the developer or whoever is using your API to understand how things are actually structured. And again, if you find any of these API inconsistencies, then use API versioning to try and stabilize and centralize all of those things. So when you're returning a order, make sure it's called order and not orders. If you've got just the one order, that kind of thing. The last tip that I'm going to give you today is about API clients. Now, an API client is the thing that requests the API. The API then returns a response back to the API client and the front end or whatever device handles that response. Now, I've built several API clients and several APIs in my time. And in some instances, in some projects, I've built both the front end website and the content management system or I've built the mobile application and the content management system and the front end website. And so you have three things potentially accessing your API that you've built. And if any of those things run off the same programming language, then you can do some clever things to do with uh, requirements in your application to make sure that you are not copying the same code. So for example, in a project that I've done uh, recently with a content management system and a front end website in PHP, what we ended up doing is using an API, building an API client in one of those, and then putting that in a composer package and requiring that in both the content management system and the front end. And therefore that API client itself becomes its own application. And that application becomes a dependency in both of those front end and content management systems. This means that you're only having to write the code once and you can test that code in isolation. You're not having to worry about the requirements of the front end website or the content management system. It becomes very isolated and you start thinking about the code in a completely different way. Because when you're building an API client that is on the public website, then perhaps you're thinking about it in the sense that you know, having different JavaScript assets or having different other dependencies, that kind of thing. By decoupling that from the front end or decoupling that from the content management system, you can start working on the API client in isolation. And then what you would do is inject that using dependencies, perhaps composer.json or perhaps an, an NPM if it's JavaScript or the Python pip stuff if it's Python. And you would inject those as dependencies in the actual installation process of the application. So when you go and deploy that application, it pulls the latest and greatest API client that you've got in its own code repository. So in the cases of the projects that I've been working on, we've had a Git repository for perhaps the front end, for the content management system, for the actual API itself, and for the API client. The front end website and the content management system are very light. All their controllers are doing are calling upon the API client that has been injected as a dependency into those projects. And you don't have to just have PHP. This is, like I said, Python and Node.js and all of that other good stuff. So when you're building your API client, try and think of it in a way of its own application and try and think of it as a decoupled thing away from whatever it is, is trying to request. So you can write your unit tests very kind of granular against the API client, not against the thing that is using that API client. Perhaps that has its own set of tests. This way, when you come to use another application that relies upon the same requests that are needed um, to get the API bits and pieces down, all you're doing then is just injecting that 
as a dependency into the new application. But I hope that's helped. If you've got any other tips, then do let me know. Put them down in the comments section below. Thank you ever so much for watching. This is also on the podcast. So thank you for listening. I'll see you again soon. Cheers. Bye.